What's up, people? Welcome to week three. I hope you're enjoying. I uh, hope you're making it through these past two weeks. Hope it's going well. Uh, I'm recording this in the future, so hopefully nothing crazy happens between this Tuesday and this Friday or Monday when I post this lecture. Uh, if anything in the national news has happened, I apologize for not mentioning it. Okay. All right. So uh, today, uh, I don't want to keep you too much today uh, in terms of this lecture because you are going to watch another lecture about uh, the adulterous woman. So I hope to keep this one to a minimal. Let's see here. Okay. Um, this week, we are going to do these things. Now look, uh, I know that my document that I show every uh, week is probably slightly different than the one that you pull up, okay? This is not a live document. Well, you know, mine's a live document. Uh, it changes and evolves as the semester goes. The one that I posted uh, on uh, Blackboard is not a live document. It is one that I posted at the beginning of the semester and that as I change mine, yours does not change. So you might see some things on yours that uh, are mine, okay? And there might be some things I listed that I was going to talk about that I decide not to talk about. All right. So don't get all too like been out of shape if you're like, hey, he was going to discuss this this week and now he's not. Um, okay. That's because I've just decided to move it if I felt like that's what needs to be done. All right. This week I'm talking about these things uh, the Labrit Mort and the Story of an Hour. I'm going to go over the expected work. Uh, I'm going to go over student sample work to demonstrate quality. I'm going to talk about the adulterous woman analysis. Well, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to show you where to watch that. Excuse me. And I think I'm going to talk again about the uh, summer novel. Not summer novel. The spring semester novel. I am already planning for the summer classes. Okay. Which, good news to you. If you're not overly successful in this course, this semester, and you have to retake 1102, I am teaching it in the summer as well, okay? So uh, there's, at least that could be a bright light in um, the dark shadow of failure if you don't do too well in this course this semester. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. Um, every time, every time, the stupid screen thing is, and every time I'm unable to, ah, to ever move it. I just want to get rid of that. Slideshow, there we go. There we go, from beginning. Good God, it's behind me. Hold on. Okay. All right, I had to make a few adjustments. I had to get the screen, focus on the right thing. And then I had a spotlight on me because I felt like this was dark, but it was blinding the crap out of me. So now that I've minimized my camera shot, uh, no more spotlight on this guy. Okay. All right, fine. Finally, week three, 1102 lecture, notes on knowledge and notes on what to do. These notes have been published uh, in the week three file as a PDF, so there you go. But if you want to take old school notes, you can. I love old school notes. I got this adult leather chopper keeper uh, for uh, holiday. In the holidays, okay. I can pull my stuff and take notes. Look at that. Look at that. That's, that's like that's real. Oh, I'm, I'm I'm accidentally going through my PowerPoint. I didn't mean to. I actually have real notes. Real notes like to write. Okay. I'm a, you know, I'm what you call a Gen Xer. An Xer. Uh, I, I'm uh, I'm part uh, Gen X. 
and then I'm, or wait, no, I'm a millennial X or X, no, that's what it is, an X millennial, part millennial <laughs> technology, and part Gen X handwriting notes. It's the marriage of both worlds. It's fantastic. There you go. Okay. Um, so here we go, week three. All right, things we're going to discuss, which I've already said. I've already gone, said that this is what we're going to do. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the Le Petit Mort in the story of an hour. Okay. Um, some people think that, um, I mean, I don't know if people think this is pornographic. It's not meant to be. All right. Um, but in this here, um, if you did your research for the phrase Le Petit Mort, then you know that Le Petit Mort is an orgasm. Okay. It's a French, uh, what we call a euphemism, meaning a nice way of saying something. Is le petit mort? It sounds it sounds intellectual. It, it's it's foreign. It's French. Okay, um, but then when you, when you look at it, you're like the little death. Uh, how is that a euphemism? Because euphemism is a nice way of saying something, but the French it, it, vocabulary itself makes it sound like a euphemism. Um, but in this here, we have Kate Chopin, the writer, giving her character uh, Josephine um, an orgasm. And um, it's supposed to imply that, like, this is the only one that Josephine ever really had. Um, so we have we have some of these key words. Uh, there was something coming to her, and she was waiting for it fearfully. She did not know. Uh, it was too subtle and elusive to name because um, that's not someone. I mean, this story was written in the, the late 1800s, which is considered the Victorian era. And even though Victorian era uh, Vic is named after Queen Victoria in England, America and England and Europe were still kind of on the same trajectory. So a lot of things that were happening in England was still happening here in high society America. And so uh, one thing that, that characterizes the Victorian era is conservatism, like social conservatism. Like women, uh, they did not show a lot of flesh. They were they were all done up to here and closed down to here. All right, and people did not talk about um, sex and uh, those kind of things. Okay, and so to have this written um, in uh, a Victorian text was very uh, controversial. Okay, um, it was subtle. It was elusive in name because people didn't talk about those things. So they, they, they didn't give those things names. But nonetheless, she still describes it. Creeping out of the sky, reaching toward her through the sounds, the scents, the color that filled the air. Now her bosom rose and fell tumultuously. She was breathing deeply. This thing was possessing her. She was filled with wild abandonment. I mean, if anybody wants uh, to pretty much like Get a great uh, example of this. YouTube, when Harry met Sally, the diner scene, okay? And you will get um, a scene where uh, where uh, Meg Ryan, she, uh, she fakes this, this very loud orgasm in the middle of, of this um, cafe to prove a point to her best friend at the time. Billy Crystal, that he would not be able to tell the difference between when a woman fakes versus when it's real. Okay, and so um, uh, she what she demonstrates is pretty much kind of like what this scene is going on right here. All right, but in this case though, it's real for Josephine, and she's having this orgasmic experience as a result of her husband's death. Okay, it's like. Uh, we might think of like this topic as being pornographic, but there is no sex that's happening here. This is one woman thinking about the fact that her husband is dead. And his death is what has brought her to the greatest joy or, or physical feeling someone ought to be able to have. And uh, out of her mouth comes the words free, free, free. So while this scene seems like a sexual scene, it's not about that at all. It uses the imagery of sex, but in a completely non-sexual 
scenario. That's what we call irony. So while a petite mort is orgasmic, the existential la petite mort is the feeling of pure freedom. An existential orgasm is the realization, the center realization that you are free, that you can actually make your own decisions and not be controlled by all the structures of society. Okay. Which is what this is really about. This is about the, the feeling of pure freedom. The feeling of pure freedom is orgasmic. This is not pornographic at all. This is about the feeling of empowerment. Okay. So the understanding of what her husband's death means to her life now causes her existential and physical orgasm. Okay. Um, because, you know, at this time, this era, women did not have social freedoms. Women, women couldn't, when this story was written, women couldn't even vote in America. Women didn't own, couldn't own property. Women could inherit property. Women could inherit a fortune. They could inherit money, but they didn't make money. Okay. Now, you know, the lower classes women had jobs, but they weren't making money. They were just trying to get enough for bread. All right. And so um, women's uh, uh, power was extremely limited in the late 1800s. In American society. So men, you know, in the, at this time, men are born free and, it's just, and society allows them to be free. Uh, they were able to own property, have jobs, make money, play the stock market, all those kind of things. Women did not. Women had two selves. They had the natural self, like born in nature. Yes, freedom. You know, I mean, a woman could walk out of her house and uh, she could she could run. She, she could walk. She could kill someone. She could nothing. She didn't have chains on her arms or uh, her hands. So in a sense, you know, she had freedom in that way. And if a woman went out to uh, the forest, you know, and built a house and hunted and uh and uh farmed you know out there on her own she had freedom but their societies she also has her society self which is the subservient self if she so like if she went out and um <clears throat> killed someone of course you know, she had the freedom to do that but then she'd be arrested as anybody would all right um but then she if she wanted to not have to and even if she went out to nature to live on her own and build a house and all that stuff. Eventually, someone will come along and say, hey, a minute, you don't own this property. You're trespassing. And she did not have this social ability to say, well, sell it to me. Let me own it. Because if she said that, they would say, "Um, your husband needs to sign up for this. Your father needs to sign for this. She didn't have the social ability to purchase property, to vote to have these jobs. She had a very distinct role to play and it was subservient. She had to work in the home. If she did what her husband told her to do and lived the life that her husband wanted her to live, then she was rewarded with money and she was rewarded with her husband saying, sure, you can go here and there with your friends, but you still need to be home though. So women, yeah, they had a free self, but it was complete, it was totally limited in society. So in this scene, when she finds out her husband's dead, all right, she has this idea that like, she's gonna be really well off. She's gonna inherit his home. She's going to inherit his money and she won't have to re if she remarry. And so she can be a widow with these things and finally have freedom. She'll be able to do the things that she wants to do and live for herself, okay? So her subservient self dies her with this uh with this moment all right and she realized that she can just be her free self so that's her little petite mort the subservient part of her dies because she, she no longer has to be subservient because now she's able to inherit these things and uh become um uh have her own self uh 
privilege, okay? So when Mr. Mallard returns, her free self then dies because when he returns, he's not dead, she's not free. She is going to be immediately back under his rule and thumb. Even though he's a nice guy, yes, but still she's having to live for him and be under his, his rule. And so in that moment, her free self then dies. She dies because she realizes she's not free because he's still there. But because her subservient self had just died at the realization of her freedom from this subservient lifestyle, she has no more lives to live. And so then literally she dies, okay? Um, and so, uh, in a moment of an hour, she's able to fully live free, which, I mean, hello, America started a war with England for the idea of freedom, okay? People, men, for centuries uh, have written about, about uh, sovereignty and the right to freedom and the glorious feeling of freedom. And at the same exact time, these men have implemented uh, in, it's essentially social enslavement upon so many of its people and limited freedom from more than half the population. So that's what we call hypocrisy. But so in this story, the little petite Mort is not pornographic. She is, Chopin is using the imagery of what people associate with being the, the best physical feeling a person can have with the most pleasurable feeling existentially a person can have, which is freedom. And she's putting those two together, which is what we call a juxtaposition. Physical orgasm with existential orgasm. All right to make this point about what what having your own independence and freedom and sovereignty feels like and then she has that ripped away from her character and she is essentially saying that death is better than going back to subservient living okay which is kind of you know yeah it's an extreme statement we make it but that's what she feels okay all right, so this relates to the waiter, and this relates very much to the adulterous woman, which you're going to watch a lecture on in just a moment, okay? Now, in that lecture, I don't specifically discuss the waiter, all right? But I want you to be thinking about this in terms of Janine. The waiter, as I discussed last week, is a role that has been created by society. But society is not natural, all right? Humans... We're, we're, we're evolved in the wild, all right? And then we started to form society and form these things, all right? But these things are not naturally created. A cave is naturally created, but like huts that serve specific purposes um, and uh, like blacksmiths and uh, weavers and all those kind of things are not just naturally exist. We, we make those, which are good things, but we make them. And so playing a role is also not just natural. People are not born. A woman's not born a housewife. A woman's not born uh, with, with knowing that her role is X, Y, Z. All right. Society says, hey, woman, these are your jobs. Hey, men, those are your jobs. All right. Not every man is born um, in, in this traditional masculine light. Uh, men are not all men are not born to naturally want to uh, kill when they don't have to kill. Like I get hunting, hunting, um, but you know, women are born with the instinct to hunt also because humans are born with the instinct to feed themselves. And so uh, these ideas of what men's work, men's ways of being, men's jobs, men's personalities are, and then the way that women's you know, jobs functions personalities are these are socially made which is why if you get into if you really start to uh dive into uh the difference between gender and sex 
sex, nature. A human is born with female reproductive organs. A human is born with male reproductive hormones. Then there are those small percentage of, uh, of people who are born with questionable reproductive or, uh, you know, uh, reproductive organs. Okay. But generally speaking, though, your reproductive organs determines your sex. Gender is different. Gender is socially constructed. This, this idea, do you fall more in line with, with the way that men are categorized? Or do you fall more in line with the way women are categorized? But still, those categories are up for debate. Uh, society says things like men shouldn't be sensitive, even though men are sensitive. Uh, society says that women ought to be uh, nurturing and kind, even though there are women who are not nurturing or kind. And if, uh, and you know, what's more unnatural, the expectation of these things or the reality of these things? And so the waiter, this, this, this symbol represents this, okay? No one is born as a waiter. They're not. The, the idea of being a waiter, of being a good waiter for tips, all right, comes with uh, adjectives and attributes that we assign, okay, that we say, this is what makes a good waiter, all right? And so then people play that way, people perform that way, and people pretend to be that way in order to get paid in their tips and, you know, tips and whatever, right? And this is not a bash on waiters because uh, I like a good waiter. Uh, I do not like crappy waiters. I like to. I know it's performative, but I'll give my tip, all right? People got to make money, all those kind of things, all right? But this really real, more so is this idea that, like, when people have an existential crisis because they feel like their function in the world is based upon this role that they play, uh, which is why sometimes when people get fired or they retire, those kind of things, they have identity crisis because that was how they identified themselves as. And that's the problem with Janine. Janine is having an identity crisis here. She feels as if she plays no part in the world because Marcel doesn't need her. Not really. So playing a role in society and where you pull your identity from that role causes anxiety and depression and pessimism. All right. Um, and so these are problematic. Um, Women who feel pressured into playing the role of the housewife of the stay-at-home mom, um, but that does not really speak to who they are personally. You know, they are often filled with anxiety, depression, and pessimism, and these kind of things. Same thing with men. Men whose nature within themselves, fatherhood and monogamy doesn't fit well with them, but yet they try to conform to that because that's the social expectation. You should be married and have children. Um, and uh, instead of listening to one's own internal thoughts, they're saying, you know what? I don't want kids, and I don't want to be married. And it would be better if those people who naturally feel that way never did succumb to the pressure of society and get married and have children and then have broken relationships. So we should just go with what we naturally feel and not succumb to this idea of the waiter becoming something that we're not really. Types of waiters, anything that, that conforms to someone else's expectations, okay? Teaching for me meets all of my needs. Um, um, it's uh, because I'm not motivated by money as much as I'm motivated by expression and reading and uh, creativity and discussion. Talk, 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 talk. I mean, this is like a prolonged book club. <laughs> it, it speaks to me. All right. You got to go with what, and like, I left schools that I did not want to conform to their style. No, I'm not. No. Okay. I'll find the place that I fit. So you don't want to uh, force yourself to conform to someone else's expectations. Um, people who are following trends just to keep up with the Joneses, uh, that's a form of waitering. Um, trying to, you know, fake it until you make it. 
I ain't faking shit, okay? So you shouldn't either. Don't fake it until you make it. Just be who you are. Uh, again, gender norms, uh, this idea of needing to, to feel masculine and do things that are masculine and then feminine doing things that are feminine, you know? Uh, now, of course, there's nothing wrong with like, if you enjoy those things, like, I like, I like working out. I like, like, I like camo. What a dude. I like football. What a dude. Okay. Um, so, I mean, like, I like things that fall into masculine norms, but not because they're masculine, just because, but because they fit who I am as a person. So, like, we shouldn't put down, you know, if a dude is sensitive and he cries, that's his natural response to that situation. He cries. So one, that person should not be shamed for crying and, 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 and be emasculated because men don't cry. That is his natural tendency. <sighs> okay. Uh, being the good Christian, being the good church goer, you can only be a good Christian if you go to church, all that kind of stuff. No. Okay. All right. So that's the idea of the waiter. You're going to make sure that you try to connect how the waiter applies to Janine and what she's doing. Okay. Now this week you're going to be do you're going to be writing some responses. You're writing paragraphs. You're writing. And so uh, I expect that, you know, when I went over the Tolman method, I went over claim support analysis last week, that you are applying that to your work, that your work reflects that. All right. And so, cause look, these grades are not pass or fail or just completion grades. They're quality grades. I look at what you're writing. I don't have to agree with it. And I might think, you know, you, you put forth the effort. And I think that like, that like, this is your best effort, even if, if it, it misses some points, fine. You know, I'm not grading you on your opinion. I'm grading you on the quality of your work. All right. So quality work is the most important aspect of this class. Someone whose work shows little effort, even if the answer is technically correct, will still receive a lower grade than a student who has more thoughtful and lengthier responses, even if I do not agree with their interpretation. Okay, so like, this is an example of some people who have turned in work for the finding sources assignment. The petite mort means low depth and symbolizes an orgasm. Yes, that is technically correct, but there's no effort put in this, in this response. Existentialism is a philosophical theory about individuals being able to make meaningful decisions. Yes, that's true. But there's, there's no real effort into this. Um, Sartre was a French novelist, playwright, and philosopher. Sartre believed in essential freedom of individuals and was the leading exponent of existentialism. Cool, but there's, there's, there's no real depth in this versus something like this. Okay. This person's one, one response to the Le Petit More question more than. All three of these combined. Le petit mort was a very popular term in the 18th and 19th centuries. It had many different meanings. Le petit mort symbolizes a short period of time when a person is unaware, unconscious, almost like when someone faints or is dizzy. It's hard for the person to focus. Le petit mort had a sexual meaning, as well referred to as a sexual release by physicians during medieval times. Le petit mort also was used in a lot of different literature. For example, the Canterbury Tales by Chaucer and many plays done by Shakespeare. And lastly, Le petit mort had a psychological meaning that many modern philosophers describe as a psychological loss after the actual act of orgasm in a sense that a person loses a part of themselves. Great. There's some grammatical errors. Yeah. There's some periods missing. Yeah. But still, a whole lot more effort put into it than this. So this will garner more, more points than this will. Okay. This might get a passing grade of like a 70, but this is going to be a quality grade of an A, all right? So right or wrong is pass or fail, but going beyond pass is a quality grade. Quality grades receive quality grades, okay? So like this right here, this is quality. It will get a quality grade. All right, discuss semester novel, here we go. Again, I've discussed this, I think first week, but I'm gonna reiterate because it's week three and if you have not, figured out what you want to read, you need to get up on it. You need to select a novel to read this semester. You will write about this novel in essay three, literary analysis. 
Your novel cannot be a book that is commonly read in school, like Shakespeare, The Great Gatsby, Of Mice and Men, The Odyssey. It must be a narrative that tells a story. It can be fiction or nonfiction. Any of these four books are these books are fantastic books. We cast a shadow. Leave the world behind. Native Sun. Piranesi. Okay, these, these are great. Um, this we cast a shadow is future. Oh man, is 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 like semi futuristic about um, instead of people being trans um, in terms of of their gender identity, it's just trans racial. People can get a, a surgery. People oh, can get a surgery to be transitioned to fully white. Um, Leave the word behind. It's sort of a post-apocalyptic novel that happens right at the possible beginning of the apocalypse. Um, Native Son is a story that takes place back in the 1930s about a uh, man who accidentally murders a uh, about a black man who accidentally murders a white woman and how he tries to cover it up. And then Clear is a sort of fantasy novel uh, that is connected to Lord uh, the Chronicles of Narnia where uh our main character is in an in-between world between and it's, it's it's very interesting i don't want to say more but you can pick one of those four if you're not sure what book you want to read um pick one of those four they're great all right so this week you're watching the lecture on the torturous woman and then uh which is important for essay one which is going to be a compare contrast analysis um, actually, no, 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 no. One of the options for essay one is a compare and contrast analysis of the story of an hour and the adulterous woman. All right. Um, it's not this. That's not the only topic you have for essay one, but that's one of the topics for essay one. Uh, you need to read Hills Like White Elephants and then uh, watch the analysis of the story. Complete Hills Like White Elephants assignment. Read the sea change. Watch the analysis of the story. Complete the sea change assignment and discuss in, in discussion three post. Discuss um, which one did you like better? Okay. Okay. So I know that like watching an analysis on all of these is a lot. It's a lot. So, you know, um, the only assignment for Hills Like White Elephant in the sea change is which one did you like better? Um, so reading Hills Like White Elephants and then reading the sea change um, is necessary to complete discussion three. Watching the analysis of each story isn't necessary, but each story is deep and the bell. And you will you might not be able to understand the two without watching my analysis, but you're not being quizzed over in the my analysis. So if you read the two of them, and then do your own research about like what they mean because you feel like you don't have time to watch my analysis. I understand that. You will have the option of writing about those two stories for essay one if you want to. All right. Um, but be beyond the discussion three posts, you don't have much work to do over those because, um, again, we start essay one next week or week four. All right. So um, the most important thing for this week after watching this lecture really is to, um, wait, no, I guess there are assignments. There's the sea change assignment and the hills at white elephant assignment, which my analysis of those would really help you a lot. So, you know, all right, I'm stupid. I'm just trying to help you out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna post this, I guess I'll post these lectures really early. Um, so that way you have plenty of time to watch all of them. All right, cool. Hope I didn't confuse you. All right. Um, so if you have any questions, though, uh, let me know. Send me an email. All right, y'all. Bye-bye.